Okay. Last month, we continued with the subsection entitled The Centers and the Senses, Normal and Super Normal. We began our last session with a statement from Arthur Avalon's Serpent Power. Quote, just as manas is necessary to the senses, the latter are necessary for manas. Manas is thus the leading indriya of which the senses are powers. So the upshot here is that without mind, the info that the senses provide is not registered. But also without the senses, the mind is incapable in and of itself of relational thinking. And since all thinking relates to the not self, we might question whether without the senses, we would be able to think at all. DK then focuses on the sense of hearing, where we learn that it is through hearing that we are introduced to the external world. Quote, in the evolution of the senses, hearing is the first vague something which calls the attention of the apparently blind self, A, to another vibration, B, to something originating outside of itself, and C, in some ways the most important, to the whole concept of externality. You could say that the indweller is imprisoned in the form aspect, blind, deaf, uh, and unable to contact the, the outer world, and except and initially through hearing. As hearing develops, then the whole concept of externality comes into focus. Um, DK then points out that it is through the law of attraction that one's consciousness moves slowly outwards towards that which is heard. Next, we learned about the qualities introduced through the sense of touch, which are ideas of size, of external texture, and of surface differences. Decay then tells us that the same series of symbols that can be applied to involutionary progression and increase and the increased activity of the chakras can also be applied to the senses, with the point at the center of the circle representing hearing, and the circle with the diameter representing the sense of touch. Though not given, we extrapolated that from this that the symbol for the sense of sight must be the circle with a cross, and the symbol for the senses of taste and smell might be the swastika. We then learned about the sense of sight, which DK tells us parallels the coming in of mind both in time and function. Sight and mind are reciprocally developed, which is why both are associated with the third root race when the spark of mind was planted in the indwelling jiva through the sacrifice of the Manasaputras. After this great event, humanity began to correlate and synthesize data received through the senses, which led to the development of language and with it, the ability to name. In this Aryan root race, the fifth, we are further developing the reciprocal relationship between sight and mind. We then learned that, quote, these three major senses, if I might so describe them, are very definitely allied, each with one of the three logoi, hearing with the third logos, touch with the second, and sight with the first logos. 
This is borne out by the involutional and evolutionary activity of the three logoi as shown in this chart. DK then tells us that the senses of taste and smell are closely allied to the sense of touch, being practically subsidiary to that sense. They're kind of three in one sense. And that the sense of touch, presumably with its two subsidiary senses of taste and smell, has a particular connection with this second solar system, which we learned in an earlier footnote uh, is astral buddhic in nature. Quote, it is characterized by emotion, by feeling, sensation, which have eventually to be transmuted into intuition, spiritual perception, and uni unity. So we've also learned that the sense of touch is connected with the astral plane and that its final revelation comes through the buddhic plane as um, uh, through the sense of taste uh, and the intuition. And this takes us up to where we left off last time. So let's continue with the reading. Um, we were in the middle of analyzing this passage and I'll just continue here. Uh, I want to remind you all that these webinars are way, way more interesting when you uh, ask questions, make comments, and we enter into a discussion about some aspect of the teachings rather than me just droning on and on here. Um, so um, I encourage you to, to uh, jump in whenever you feel like uh, you have an idea or a question. So it is of value to study the extensions of physical plane touch on other planes and to see whether we are led. All right, here are the demonstrations of the sense of touch on the higher planes. You know, because it's so familiar to us, we tend to base our understanding of this and actually all the senses on its lowest expression. In this case, the sense of touch, physical sense of touch, when actually uh, touch's truest form demonstrates on the buddhic and atmic planes as active service and healing. It is here that we need to search for the essence of this sense, the true nature of this sense, not in physical touch, which is actually the most veiled of the five expressions of this sense. Next, it is the faculty which enables us to arrive at the essence by due recognition of the veiling sheath. Millions of years of using the senses to familiarize ourselves with our three veiling sheaths, you know, the physical, uh, etheric, the astral, and the mental sheaths, allows us to gradually penetrate all this time uh, to gradually penetrate the illusion that uh, the senses represent. Bolstered by taste and smell, touch initiates a penetration of the veiling sheath, which at each progressive stage further reveals the true nature of the not-self, the true nature of the not-self, not the apparent outer qualities of the not-self. Then through the correlative and synthesizing activity of mind, we discover that the essence imprisoned by the not-self is identical to our own essence. And at that high stage of development, we can truly say, not is, but me. One, another way of saying we are one in essence. Next, it enables the thinker who fully utilizes it 
to put himself en rapport with the essence of all selves at all stages, and thereby to aid in the due evolution of the sheath and actively to serve. So, by means of the sense of touch and its higher correspondences, we are eventually able to put ourselves, quote unquote, en rapport with the essence of all selves at all stages, with the end goal being the ability to wield healing and active service. So just as we come to know ourselves through hearing, it is through the sense of touch that we come to know our brother who personifies the not self, puts a face on the not self. Thus, touch represents the ability to penetrate that which separates, as does Neptune the ruler of this sense and of the astral plane where this sense rules, which fosters Neptune, which fosters sensitivity, penetration, and permeation compared to Saturn on the physical plane, uh, which regiments separation. The Atmic stage described in this passage wherein the initiate is able to put oneself, quote, en repos with the essence of all selves at all stages, represents the ability to forge a direct link with the indweller in all sheaves through active service. So that direct link he's suggesting comes through one's active service. That's how the link between uh, in the indwelling jivas is forged. This level of service was demonstrated by Jesus and recounted by the apostle Luke, who described a woman who touches Jesus's cloak and is instantly healed. Jesus asked, who touched him? And when the woman came forward, he told her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You can see that this would, you know, in order to um, have used this level of healing, um, Jesus would have been uh, consciously able to use the sense of touch on the buddhic plane. Yes, Barbara. I'm wondering about the relationship of prana <clears throat> to um, touch. And mm -hmm. if um, uh, prana, is uh, uh, prana is necessary, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, cooperation uh, with touch, um, to have the um, uh, touch penetrate en enough to um, uh, create a change. Yeah, well, I think we're sustained by the touch of prana. And, and I'm really glad you brought that up because I hadn't thought about it. But, you know, uh, the difference between hearing is that it's and touch is that um, hearing is involutional and we use it to to uh contact the not self whereas touch is used by the soul aspect the second aspect to reach us you could say um and i think it, it, it along with that along with the soul you have the all those solar angels that wield prana, we are touched by prana. You know, it's um, uh, the solar angels make available to our etheric bodies this uh, continuously restorative principle called prana. It's really the vital aspect. And I think you're right on in associating touch with uh, that impress from the um, the solar angels uh, also from 
through planetary prana of the uh, Vila Devas of the higher, uh, the four high subplanes of the physical plane. I, I think they also, quote unquote, touch the touch us via um, prana. So, great observation. Thank you, Barbara. Anyone else? Okay. I've found um, through the decades that I've studied decay, um, uh, real pleasure in discovering the esoteric truth behind many of different Bible stories, uh, often uh, uh, New Testament stories, and you see some principle being demonstrated by the Christ. Yes, Jerry. Um, I'm intrigued by your statement of uh, the solar angel uh, providing prana, and uh, could could you say more about that, or direct me to uh, a place in the writing that discusses that? Well, sure. About actually, I didn't say that the solar angels provide prana. I said that the. I mean that eh, the there's these. <laughs> I can see why you would think I said that. There's a group of golden solar devas. Ah, okay who are uh, carry the essence of solar prana and we are touched by them um, yeah. both both with and without the sun but particularly you know TK constantly suggests that we uh, get out in the sunshine and um, and I think even though he doesn't directly relate the two ideas i think it it's uh allows this solar prana to have a full impact on us okay thank you yeah and then there's you know all of this was it's about in and around from about page 80 to 100 110 and a tcf um a couple of years ago we we really got into this um topic of solar and planetary prana and how you know uh the different sources for this okay next up can we get a reader please and veronica hello hello uh, I want to say uh, uh, the woman that touched uh, the Christ, her name was Veronica. Oh, that's great. And she was known as, uh, well, we say Veronica Morosa, Veronica that was bleeding. She was known like that. And as soon as she touched uh, Christ's uh, garment, she was instantly cured. And Christ knew that somebody touched him because he felt the energy going from his body. And he looked around asking who touched me because he could feel that energy that had left him. And also Veronica is uh, at uh, uh, when Christ goes up the um, uh, to be um, oh, God, crucified, God. she comes out of the crowd and she um, uh, cleans his face with a, 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 a cloth, um. and he does his last uh, um, miracle. His face uh, gets burned on the cloth. Ah. It's not only the, 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 the big cloth that we've got with the body of Jesus, but it's also this. And that was Veronica too. And so in, in, in the big week uh, where we go for, for the Easter week on Thursday, her name is in the church said. You can hear the name Veronica when they say the, I don't know how to say them, the Gospels, the, uh, what they say in the Orthodox Church. Yeah, well, there are three of the apostles tell this story. Uh, and uh, so you were named after that Veronica. Well, so my mother liked the name, but it has this uh, 
the story behind it. <laughs> yeah, great, great, great. Thank you for that. Okay. A Lord of Compassion is one who by means of touch feels with fully comprehend, feels with fully comprehends and realizes the manner in which to heal and correct the indecacies of the not self and thus actively to serve the plan of evolution. We should study likewise in this connection the value of touch as demonstrated by the healers of the race, those on the Bodhisattva line, and the effect of the law of attraction and repulsion, and, la and thus manipulated by them. Students of etymology will, will have noted that the origin of the word touch is somewhat obscure, but probably means to draw with quick motion. Herein lies the whole secret of this objective solar system, and herein will be demonstrated the quickening of vibration by means of touch. Inertia, mobility, rhythm, of the qualities manifested by the not self rhythm balance and stable vibrations are achieved by means of this very faculty of touch or feeling thank you and veronica okay first a lord of compassion is one who by means of touch feels with fully comprehends and realizes the manner in which to heal and to correct the inadequacies of the not self and thus actively to serve the plan of evolution so with the statement we learn the deeper purpose of the of buddhic plane healing which is to quote unquote correct the inadequacies of the not self and thus actively to serve the plan of evolution this, we might hypothesize, would include removing impediments, which may or may not uh, include healing one's physical ills, which is what we normally consider to be the purpose of healing. But it might, in, it might also involve or only involve, for instance, weakening the hold of some regressive thought form. Uh, or dissipating an astral glamour that is holding the aspirant back. Most initiates who reach the stage of master become lords of compassion in this astral buddhic solar system and thus will aid in this healing work. Only a comparative few, like the master DK, follow the line that leads to becoming a master of wisdom which focuses on developing the sense of sight and the correlative synthesizing senses of mind. Next, we should study likewise in this connection the value of touch as demonstrated by the healers of the race, those on the Bodhisattva line. On page two of Esoteric Healing, we're told that all initiates of the Ageless Wisdom are necessarily healers, though all may not heal the physical body. The reason for this is that all souls that have achieved any measure of true liberation are transmitters of spiritual energy. This automatically affects some aspect of the mechanism which is used by the souls they contact. So as to the Bodhisattva line, the uh, Letters on Occult Meditation, in a Letters on Occult Meditation, DK tells us, quote, what I seek to bring out here are the three clear lines whereby a man may mount to the Logos and find union with the self of the solar system. He can mount by the line of the Manu. He can attain through the line of the Bodhisattva. Or uh, he can reach the goal via the path of the Mahachohan. But 
especially note that on this planet, the Lord of Love and Power, the first Kumara, is the focal point for all three departments. The Bodhisattva line is the line of the world teacher who works with the evolving life within the form. Those who follow this line work with the great spiritual ideas as taught, for example, by the Master DK. Next, uh, the footnote referenced by the phrase, those on the Bodhisattva line reads, the line of the Bodhisattva is that of love wisdom and of the detailed science of the soul. It is the teaching line and the path up upon which all must eventually pass. So the Bodhisattva emerges on the second ray line which is also called the ray of detailed unity and the ray of meticulous entirety. Master DK is especially adept at teaching the quote, detailed science of the soul, as was Patanjali, the author of the Yoga Sutras. Other teachers such as Rudolf Steiner, Sri Aurobindo are also on this line. The fact that all must eventually pass onto this line is a reminder that all the rays are sub rays of the second ray and that all endeavor on all paths leads to the solo logos the source of second ray expression any thoughts or questions keep them coming guys let's see what you have in the chat here uh, right, Magda says, Leonardo's the creation of Adam, which is the touch of God. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. In the, in the uh, Sistine Chapel, you have, uh, you know, that incredible ceiling painting where obviously it's the sense of touch that is being demonstrated in the creation. Um, and Ben says, Veronica Vero icon, true image, face of Christ appears on the veil of Veronique's. Uh, or, yeah, she removed her veil for her act of compassion to clean Jesus's face. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. I forgotten about that thanks to both of you okay <clears throat> okay next and the effect of the law of attraction and repulsion as thus manipulated by them let's see um, right, this is a continuation of voices. Uh, in its connection, the value of the touch as demonstrated by the healers of the race and the effect of the law of attraction and repulsion as manipulated by them. So using the law of attraction and magnetism, healers draw in those qualities needed for healing. Uh, to do that, one has to be completely decentralized because otherwise that uh, sense of the lesser self uh, keeps one from being able to, it's an emanating force that keeps one from being able to draw in those qualities needed. Um, so these healers that draw in these qualities also at the same time are able to repulse diseased and outworn forms and energies that are um, um, creating harm or blockage of some sort. Next. Students of etymology will have noted that the origin of the word touch is somewhat obscure. 
but probably means to draw with quick motion. This definition suggests a gesture frequently found in the subtle healing arts wherein oppressive or miasmic energy is drawn off by moving the hands quickly as though to draw off some negative form of energy, thus allowing more beneficial energy to flow in. Drawing is particularly related to the second ray and the quick motion to the first ray, showing the use of both the laws of attraction and repulsion. That this gesture forms the etymological root of the word touch suggests its true and higher meaning. Next, herein lies the whole secret of this objective solar system, and herein will be demonstrated the quickening of vibration by means of touch. DK again confirms that the sense of touch is preeminent in this astral buddhic solar system. Interestingly, one of the names of the first ray lord, uh, as given in Esoteric Psychology Volume 1, is the power that touches and withdraws, indicating the primary mode of vibratory stimulation in this solar system. You know, that's, that's suggested by that um, painting in the Sistine Chapel, right? The power that touches and then withdraws. Um, the rising and blending of the Kundalini fire is a prime example of a disciple's response to the touch of the monad via the soul, but uh, the true source of that um, uh, Kundalini energy is monadic. And finally, inertia, mobility, rhythm, are the qualities manifested by the not self. Rhythm, balance, and stable vibration are achieved by this very faculty of touch or feeling. Okay, so inertia, mobility, rhythm, also known as tamas, rajas, and sattva, are the three gunas that describe the activity of the not self. Rhythm, balance, and stable vibration relate to the third guna called sattva. In relating the sense of touch to sattva, DK is pointing out the importance of the second ray in achieving the sattvic or balanced state, which allows for the next stage of the evolutionary process to begin. Yes, Magda. Um, yes, I find this great. This page um, is a resume, it puts it all together how like a, a master uh, um, acts in, um, in correcting all this not self and physical, as you said, not just physical, but also not self. And how he does it is really like this, it's like quickening, it's like the quickening I connected with the movement of very, uh, of a fetus, so very light, soft movements, like almost unperceptible, they can become also physical, perceptible on your body, on your chakras, on the Kundalini, on the skin. And then I was going to ask you, why does this uh, characterize this logos? This what? solar system, I'm sorry. Herein lies the whole secret of this objective solar system. So of this solar system in opposition with what as a initiation method of this kind? Well, this is a second aspect oriented solar system. Touch is the second sense and its rules on the atmic buddhic plane, which is the main expression of this solar system, just as. Okay. Thank you. Got it. Yep. This site will be the the primary objective of the next solar system yeah thank okay. you yeah okay all right 
Next up, can we get a reader, please? Barbara, you want to read? Let me illustrate briefly so as to make the problem somewhat clearer. What results in meditation? <clears throat> By dint of strenuous effort and due attention to rules laid down, the aspirant succeeds in touching matter of a quality rarer than is his usual custom. He contacts his causal body. In time, he contacts the matter of the buddhic plane. By means of this touch, his own vibration is temporarily and briefly quickened. Fundamentally, we are brought back to the subject that we deal with in this treatise. The latent fire of matter attracts to itself that fire latent in other forms. They, they touch and recognition and awareness ensues. The fire of manas burns continuously and is fed by that which is attracted and repulsed. When the two blend, the stimulation is greatly increased and the ability to touch intensified. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. First, let me illustrate briefly so as to make the problem somewhat clearer. What results in meditation? By dint of strenuous effort and due attention to rules laid down, the aspirant succeeds in touching matter of a quality rarer than is his usual custom. He contacts his causal body. In time, he contacts the matter of the buddhic plane. By means of this touch, his own vibration is temporarily and briefly quickened. Notice the sense of touch all through because contact can also be like a synonym for, for touching, right? Um, so this passage suggests that one of the fundamental purposes of meditation is to touch and gradually assimilate matter of a higher vibration to bring into your, um, to replace <clears throat> the grosser, uh, uh, matter in your system with uh, matter of a higher vibration. The above described quickening, which comes by dint of strenuous effort initially, comes about through the second guna, rajas. But when brief quickening becomes an established vibration, it creates a heightened stability within one's energy system, which time the sattvic state is achieved. So first, you know, through, through uh, interactivity, the quality of rajas, one is able to reach out and touch uh, at a peak moment, um, for instance, one's causal body. Um, but over, um, you know, through habitual meditation uh, over a period of years, um, that uh, those brief moments become a, um, a continuous experience. And then the state of, of um, you could say, constant contact, uh, which is sattvic in nature, is gained. Okay, next. Fundamentally, we are brought back to the subject that we deal with in this treatise. The latent fire of matter attracts to itself that fire latent in other forms. They touch and recognition and awareness ensues. The fire of manas burns continuously and is fed by that which is attracted and repulsed. When the two blend, the stimulation is great, greatly increased, and the ability to touch intensified. So this is it's descriptive of a few things. It's descriptive of the Kundalini process, 
wherein the fires of like nature attract and make contact through the sense of touch. You know, first the fires of matter, touch, and blend with the fires of prana. Then this combined fire touches then blends with the fires of mind. And finally, this triple fire attracts the down rushing fire of spirit. All of this happens through the sense of, of touch. When the combined lower fires blend with this higher fire, the causal body shatters and the initiate moves on to the lower subplanes of the buddhic plane. At each stage, when like touches like, awareness ensues, which promotes increased stimulation, resulting in the sense of touch becoming more acute and thus more responsive. This passage is also descriptive of the interpenetration that makes group consciousness possible. Through touch, the jivas comprising a group penetrate the separating boundaries and in so doing discover a synthetic self that overshadows the group. Identification with this synthetic self, with this presence, creates group consciousness. It's actually a, quite a high stage of becoming. Any thoughts or questions? Comments? Insights? Okay. Next up, can we get a reader, please? Gordon, you want to read? The law of attraction persists in its work until another fire is attracted and touched, and the threefold merging is completed. Forget not in this connection the mystery of the rod of initiation. Later, when we consider the subject of the centers and initiation, it must be remembered that we are definitely studying one aspect of this mysterious faculty of touch, the faculty of the second logos, wielding the law of attraction. Let us now finish what may be imparted on the remaining three senses, sight, taste, smell, and then briefly sum up the relationship to the centers and their mutual action and interaction. That will then leave two more points to be dealt with in this first division of the treatise on consummate fire and a summing up. We shall then be in a position to take up that portion of the treatise that deals with the fire of Manas and with the development of the Manasaputras, both in their totality and likewise individually. Thank you, Gordon. Okay, first, the law of attraction persists in its work until another fire is attracted and touched, and the threefold merging is completed. So DKK gives a full description of this process in his subsection on the Kundalini. Here, he emphasizes that the entire Kundalini process is a function of the sense of touch. Next. Forget not, in this connection, the mystery of the rod of initiation. So the sentence suggests two ideas. First, that the rod of initiation is a way of extending the touch of the initiator. Certain Eastern masters have been known to convey an initiatory potency to their chelas simply by touching them often quite suddenly and unexpectedly. And second, one of the functions of the rod of initiation is to correlate and synthesize the fires active at a particular stage of initiation. Whenever uh, a stage is correlated and synthesized, it creates the, uh, a, a, a place of balance from which the next stage can begin. 
Let's take a look at the footnote referenced by this statement here. Um, could we get a reader for this, please? Janet. The initiations spoken of in this treaty are the major initiations which bring about those expansions of consciousness which lead to liberation. These are taken in the causal body and from hence reflected into the physical. The initiate never proclaims his initiation. Okay, um, let's take a look at what MDR has to say concerning this footnote. We can read her, please. Jerry, do you want to read? Yes. By major initiations, decayed does not mean the third degree and beyond for the first and second and initiations of the threshold are also taken in the causal body. There are minor initiation, initiations, initiations of the four elements taken between the major initiations and especially between the first and second initiations. Initia initiations taken in the causal body are reflected not only in the physical body, but in the astral and mental vehicles as well. It goes without saying that the initiate will not and cannot proclaim his initiation. Those who thus proclaim signal that they cannot possibly be true initiates. Yet, the persistent ego will proclaim and make all sorts of excuses for doing so. Let those who have eyes to see, see. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Uh, yeah, any thoughts or questions about this? You know, he's, he's making the point that major initiations take place in the causal body. And, you know, in, uh, sometimes when DK is talking about major initiations, he's starting with the third initiation because um, they, that then allows for the, um, uh, it, it's, it represents um, the uh, soul and personality integration, right? Um, but in this case, uh, major initiations mean those that take place in the causal body compared to the minor initiations that can take place uh, uh, as um, in, in interim um, gains made um, between the, especially between the first and second initiations and that take place on the um, astral plane. Okay, next up, later when we consider the subject of the centers and initiation, it must be remembered that we are definitely studying one aspect of this mysterious faculty of touch, the faculty of the second logos, wielding the law of attraction. Notice how DK layers his teachings. Uh, first, we learned about Kundalini force uh, about 100 pages ago, about how it stimulates the chakras until they form circulating fiery triangles. Then we learned about the symbols that represent the stages of development of these chakras. Then, during this session, we learned how the surging kundalini is a function of both touch and the law of attraction, which is, quote unquote, the faculty of the second logos. And finally, he here tells us, that in the upcoming session, we'll learn about how Kundalini relates to the initiations. Yes, Nadell. Can you speak any more about the these minor initiations between the first and the second? I've not heard of that before. Yeah, there's not much emphasis on them. 
Um, so, you know, for instance, between the first and second, that's the longest period uh, between any of the initiations because the first initiation is just um, you cross the threshold uh, and you you could say step onto the path. The, the image often used is a, a, a baby in a basket set on the uh, steps of the temple. So no particular gains have been made uh, by the initiate, but has that initiate has signaled that um, uh, it is prepared, has prepared itself to uh, do the work of becoming. So the long path to the second initiation, wherein one demonstrates control of the astral uh, plane, you could you could read about the particulars of that in the uh, labors associated with Scorpio and the nine-headed Hydra, and you could even use it. See, DK doesn't tell you exactly. Well, this happens at this minor initiation, and this happens at this minor initiation, but in that labor, uh, there are these heads of the Hydra that represent uh, various stages of becoming. Uh, three of them connected with the physical plane, three with the astral, and three with the mental, the lower mental. Those, I think, there would be correlations with uh, minor initiations. And that's, as I know it's, a, it's a, a general statement, but that's really all we're given. So thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Barbara? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, in, in some um, metaphysical teachings, uh, the causal body holds a lot of um, patterning information in uh, elaborate uh, geometry, um, patternings that um, um, continue from lifetime to lifetime. So I, I, I wonder... Um, what it is that actually uh, is transformed in the causal body um, during an initiation? Yeah, um, well, you know, I, I love it when, um, you know, when you bring up this, uh, the geometry involved in these transformations, because, um, you know, uh, a given stage represented, for instance, by a minor initiation would definitely transform the geometry of the initiate um, into a, a clearer, more simplified and direct expression, right? Um, because DK tells us that uh, the geometry of quote unquote average man is quite complex, irregular, and, and, and us asymmetric, right? And that as progress is made, a symmetry comes in. And of course, we can assume that that is because through symmetry, energy is more easily circulated, right? So um, that symmetry uh, expresses itself through an um, the, uh, an increased circulation of the higher forces through the personality. And then um, as personality aspects are transformed, then the geometry is also simplified. You know, it'd be absolutely fascinating to <laughs> be given a series of geometrical forms that represent certain stages along the way, including all these minor initiations, but um, we can uh, you know, we can assume that that is indeed the case until, you know, um, finally when you're uh, uh, initiated, in fact, through one of the major initiations, quote unquote, the five pointed star flashes over the head of the initiate, representing, you know, now a very stable um, form and a very regular uh, form that is easily circulates the energy. Okay. Um, and of course, all of this 
would take place in the causal body. You asked specifically about the causal body. This would, uh, until that, the fourth initiation, when the causal body itself is shattered, all this transforming geometry would be visible within the causal body. You know, the whole, whole metaphor of the, um, of the petals unfolding um, would be another way of looking at these transformations and of this, you could say, simplified and uh, symmetric, sim uh, more symmetrical geometry that would take place. Yes, Magda? Yes, I think the perfect image uh, of the um, fourth, at least fourth initiated man as a symmetrical body as the Vitruvian man by this time, yes, Leonardo. The other one, the Adam, was Michelangelo. I get confused because they are the epitome of the touch. One, Leonardo, uh, Michelangelo, and Leonardo of the symmetrical man that can that has arrived to such a light body and a symmetrical body because God geometrizes so that he can receive that touch with the finger by the God. So I got confused by the by the two artists, but you know, that's why. Right, right. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Magda. Okay. Okay. So, uh, later when we consider the subject of the center's initiation, it must be remembered that we are definitely studying one aspect of this mysterious faculty of touch, the faculty of the second logos, wielding the law of attraction. Okay, that's where we left off. And so now we'll go come to the next section. Oops. Uh, let us now finish what may be imparted on the remaining three senses. So we're, we're shifting sections here. Sight, taste, smell, and then briefly sum up their relationship to the centers and their mutual uh, action and interaction. So, so far we've covered hearing and touch. DK will cover the last three senses over the next few pages, followed by a five page summary of the senses. Next, that will then leave two more points to be dealt with in this first division of the treatise on cosmic fire and a summing up. We shall then be in a position to take up that portion of the treatise that deals with the fire of Manas and with the development of the Manasaputras, both in their totality and likewise individually. Following the section on the senses, we have the last subsection in this division called the centers and initiation, which is followed by the final relatively short division F. I was gonna take a picture of these pages, but I uh, didn't get around to it. Called, division F called the law of economy. The quote, two more points dealt with or the two subsections of that division F. And those two subsections are entitled Its Effects and Matter, talking about the law of economy, um, and the subsidiary laws, a whole series of laws connected with the law of economy. The quote, portion of the treatise that deals with the fire of Manas and with the development of the Manasaputras, both in their totality and likewise individually, is the hundred, no, is the thousand and eight page long second section of the book entitled Solar Fire the fire of mind. So a treatise on cosmic fire is divided into three sections. We're coming towards the end of the first section, which has to do with the third aspect, the, uh, the appearance aspect. And we will be moving into the, um, you know, which represents almost, you know, all but a couple of hundred pages of the, of TCF, this thousand and eight page section on the second 
aspect of the book called Solar Fire, the Fire of Mind. Okay, so he's giving just he's introducing the fact that this is coming up. Okay, um, next the footnote referenced by the term Manasaputras states Manasaputras. These are the sons of mind, the individual principle in man, the ego, the solar angel in his own body on the abstract levels of the mental plane. There's actually a lot in this short statement. Sons of mind is the literal translation of the Sanskrit term Manasaputra. These Agnishvatas take form as causal bodies on the higher mental plane in order to be agents for the unfolding mind of God, right? Sons of mind, mind of God, as it works out its plans through them. Though called sons of mind, they are as solar angels on their own plane, parentless, having achieved immortality in an earlier cycle. Can we get a reader for this, please? Joe. I'm here. The law of the Lotus. This is the name given to the mysterious influence from the cosmic law of attraction, which brought in the divine sons of mind and thus link the two poles of spirit and matter, producing upon the plane of mind that which we call the egoic lotus or the flower of the self. It is the law which enables the lotus to draw from the lower nature, the matter aspect and the water aspect, the moisture and heat necessary for its unfoldment and to bring down from the levels of the spirit that which is is to it what the rays of the sun are to the vegetable kingdom. Thank you, Joe. Okay, the Manasaputras are, quote, the individual principle in man in their role as soul. For until animal man was overshadowed by these great beings, man belonged to the mass conscious third kingdom of potential to become an individual fostered through the sign Leo, because Leo is the sign where individualization took place, is only possible through the influence of the true self. Can we get a reader for this, please? Justin. By answer notes that the mind works that the mind world is peopled by six groups of gods, the six groups of egos and their six rays, the six sub rays of the one synthetic ray, which is apparently inferred. This are, these are the sons of mind, the Agnes Vatias, and they are portrayed as one ful fulfilling their desires therefore driven by desire to incarnate, to endowed with atomization and other powers, therefore able to create their vehicles of mani manifestation. Three, living for a mundane period, therefore in, a, in incarnation, incarnation during a world period. Four, goodly, to behold, for the sons of God are luminous, radiant, and full of beauty. Five, delighting in love, for love is the, the characteristic of the soul, and all sons of God, or sons of mind, reveal the love of the Father. Six, possessing bodies of their own, not caused by parents. That body, not made by hands, Eternal in the heavens, mentioned by St. Paul. Thank you, Kirsten. Okay. 
Okay, next up, can we get a reader, please? Magda. This topic is of the most imperative importance as it deals entirely with men, the ego, the thinker, and shows the cosmic blending of the fires of matter and of mind and their utilization by the indwelling flame. Sight. This sense, as said before, is the paramount correlating sense of the solar system. Under the law of economy, man hears. Sound permeates matter and is the basis of its subsequent heterogeneity. Under the law of attraction, man touches and makes contact with that which is brought to his attention through sound waves of activity. This leads to a condition of mutual repulsion and attraction between the one who apprehends and that which is apprehended. Thank you, Magda. Okay, first, this topic is of the most imperative importance as it deals entirely with man, the ego. So he's still talking about the uh, uh, up, upcoming section here. Uh, with man, the ego, the thinker, and shows the cosmic blending of the fires of matter and of mind and their utilization by the indwelling flame. So um, let's take a look at, uh, this is his. This is uh, DK's last comment on what will be coming up. It actually starts on page two, two twenty, two twenty one, somewhere in there. So we're uh, getting close. Uh, so this is MDR's comments on this statement. Can we get a reader, please? Maria Cristina. Um, the essence of the coming section is clearly given. We are the ego, the thinker on his own plane. On this planet and in this solar system, we are learning to be fully that ego thinker. And to express the potencies of the ego thinker in the lower worlds, as well as upon the higher mental plane. D.K., who does not exaggerate, tells it that the coming theme is of imperative importance. We should take him at his word and learn to realize ourselves as souls in expression, as the ego thinker in incarnation. The term indwelling flame relates to the spirit aspect. We have studied the word flame and seen its close connection to pure being and also to the more objective aspects of fire. Thank you, Maria Cristina. Okay, so now we're starting a new section here on site. The sense, as said before, is, is the paramount correlating sense of the solar system. So the term, term correlative relates sight to the sixth sense of mind which interrelates all aspects of the not-self to form a cohesive understanding. MDR relates sight to both Mercury and Venus, which rules the two eyes, just as the sun rules the third synthesizing eye. Next, under the law of economy, man hears. Sound permeates matter and is the basis of its subsequent heterogeneity. As an agent of the law of economy, sound is used by the third logos to scatter the atoms of matter and dissociate them from one another. But sound also promotes the indweller's connection with the realm of the not-self. Next, under the law of attraction, man touches and makes contact with that which is brought to his attention through the sound waves of activity. So just as sound is the primary involutional tool for creation, touch is one of the fundamental tools for evolution, 
for it enables contact, interpenetration, and eventual synthesis. You can see how sound and touch work together here. The directionality of sound orients the indwelling jiva towards that which it will eventually touch. And finally, this leads to a condition of mutual repulsion and attraction between the one who apprehends and that which is apprehended. So the law of attraction promotes synthesis with that which enhances evolution, whereas the law of repulsion allows the seeker to discard that which hinders his or her forward progress. Okay, next up, can we get a reader please? Midi. Having apprehended and then contacted, his eyes are opened and he recognizes his place in the whole order under the law of synthesis. Hearing, unity, touch, duality, sight, triplicity. In these three senses, the present is summed up for us. The work of the evolution is to recognize, utilize, coordinate, and dominate the whole till the self. By means of these three, becomes actively aware of the every form, of every vibration, and of every pulsation of the not-self. Then, through the arranging power of mind, the objective of the self will be to find the truth or that center in which the circle, the center in the circle of manifestation, which is for the self, the center of equilibrium and the one point where the coordination is perfected. Then the self can dissociate itself from every veil, every contact and every sense. Thank you, Midi. Okay, first, having apprehended and then contacted, his eyes are opened and he recognizes his place in the whole order under the law of synthesis. Hearing, unity, touch, duality, sight, triplicity. So hearing is a function of the law of economy, touch of the law of attraction, and sight of the law of synthesis. Hearing affords a perceived unity of the separated self, the fundamental portal onto the not-self. Touch, the duality of that which is contacted, and sight, the third portal, eventually making possible apprehension of the three-in-one of monadic unity. He's going to talk more about this, uh, especially the idea of triplicity as it relates to sight. Okay, next, in these three senses, the present is summed up for us, meaning that this present fifth root race is a testament to the evolution of these three senses. Next. We have one long summary sentence. Uh, the work of evolution is to recognize, utilize, coordinate, and dominate the whole till the self, by means of these three, meaning these three senses, becomes actively aware of every form, of every vibration, and of every pulsation of the not-self. Okay, so the whole is all aspects of one's environment, including all other imprisoned sentient beings. Recognizing, then utilizing, then coordinating, and finally dominating are the four progressive stages of awareness of the not-self, awareness of the not-self, gained through the five senses over millennia of incarnations becomes actively aware of every 
form of every vibration and of every pulsation of the not self includes all forms on the physical, astral, and mental planes, which translates into an exhaustive, integrated understanding of the lower quaternary. We might use the five symbols we've been working with, not only to represent the individual senses, but also to give understand, uh, also to understand man's progressive awareness of the not self. In the final analysis, this successive awareness applies not only to every form, but also to every vibration and every pulsation, suggesting in both cases, the effect of the indwelling jiva on the inhabited form. Yes, Nadell. This sort of reminds me of uh, that saying, like always my feet have tried and I'm called by the way of fire. It almost sounds as though all those ways are what we just talked about going through all the aspects, those pulsations of not self. We've done all of that. Now the way of fire calls you. I agree completely. I, yeah. I that's exactly what it's referring to, really. Yeah. Just a sec. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay, next. Then through the arranging power of mind. The objective of the self will be to find the truth or that center in the circle of manifestation, which is for the self, the center of equilibrium and the point and the one point where the coordination is perfected. Okay, so the point in the center of the circle, which is the self in manifestation, here called by DK, the truth is ever present during all stages of becoming, though due to the immersion in form, is temporarily lost sight of. But at that stage on the evolutionary path, when the arranging correlating power of mind begins to function, the self through the still vo small voice of the soul begins to exert itself which in turn activates the synthetic aspect of higher mind. This allows the indweller, represented by the point, to become aware of the, quote, center of equilibrium, which is sattvic, and thus transcends both the inertia and activity of form life. Okay, then finally we have, then the self can dissociate itself from every veil, every contact, and every sense. Equilibrium releases one from the pull of form life, and the self stands free. This initially happens at the fourth initiation, called the liberation, and then progressively at each subsequent initiation from the fifth to the ninth latter which is called the refusal during which the initiate refuses any contact with the cosmic physical plane he thought your questions you guys are quiet today um ideas okay next up yes jerry um this is uh, a question uh, going back to what we were previously dis discussing. Sure. And um, it, if you don't think it's appropriate to ask, that's fine. But I'm, I'm curious about the differences between the, uh, uh, the Lords of Compassion and uh, the uh masters of wisdom and mm -hmm. um and um so one question that i have is that given 
you know, where we're at and, you know, the, uh, the fifth root race, um, do you think that there's still that ongoing distinction as, as, uh, uh, individuals take the fifth initiation that there's still um uh, masters of compassion oh yes yeah yeah you know because i mean dk wrote this material uh you know in the 20s and 30s and 40s um and so it's totally relevant to this root race which has been going on for you know um hundreds of thousands of years. So, uh, so yeah, I think it's it's relevant to this root race still, as you say. Um, I have a corollary question. Um, so it, it seems to me that, that people who are students who are studying esoterics would be more likely to be on the uh, line of uh, masters of wisdom, you know, that uh, path. What type of student would be on the Lords of Compassion? Oh, I would think, first of all, you know, uh, most students of Christianity, of um, religion. Let me be careful here, though. Um, it's more the approach than the particular discipline, I would think, you know, um, I would think, you know, Buddhism tends to be more mental, but I've seen, I happen to know many Buddhists are very much on the line of, you know, kind of six, six uh, slash second ray approach to Buddhism being particularly attracted to the ritual um, and the feeling aspect of Buddhism. So I think it has more to do with the approach than the, than the, um, than the actual line itself. Though I do think that, um, you know, these lines, you know, DK tells us that Mohammedism and Christianity are six ray expressions um, that um, um, Judaism is a third ray expression. Um, he doesn't, I don't think he indicates um, which ray expression is Buddhism? I see of, uh, in I see a lot of mental orientation in Buddhism, uh, though as I said, many of its practitioners are also on the six slash second ray. Um, but he, you know, he he tells us in no uncertain words that you know most human jivas come up through that line of the Lords of Compassion. Uh, and in fact, it's that group that go to Sirius on the fourth fourth path, you know, that uh, that uh, the fourth of the, of the seven cosmic paths, which leads to Sirius are made up mostly of Lord, of those who follow the, the line of the Lord of Compassion, which is interesting because uh, the reason that they go to Sirius is in order to further develop the monastic principle. So there's a kind of balancing of their nature that takes place um, with that. And then uh, also that um, a great number of the of masters of wisdom end up on the, on the ray path and the path of the planetary logos, right? Uh, and this is particular to our Earth scheme that um, on other planets in the solar system that the line of the master of wisdom is more dominant, uh, more pronounced. You know, for example, he tells us that um, that there are uh, planets in the solar system where its humanity mostly takes the path of the the ray path the fifth path um which is also correlative to the path of the planetary logos so that's those are just some ideas about your questions thank you yeah okay i think we'll pull the plug here